Fire is a good servant, but a bad master still holds true today. Unfortunately, many persons do not pay attention to the disastrous effects a fire can have until it's too late. On 411 this week, we look at a fire, the good and bad master, and how some of the bravest men and women prepare for their role as a firefighter. I am Shivani Rampasad. Stay tuned to Guyana 411. Ready source of water is the key to fighting most fires. Years ago, a bright red fire hydrant was like a beacon calling to a firefighter. Today, if you do find a fire hydrant, it is a mere reminder of what used to be. But efforts are being implemented to restore the fire hydrant as a main tool in fighting a fire. Every time a fire occurs within the precincts of Georgetown, the in operation of fire hydrants is highlighted as a sore point as there is never a ready sufficient supply of water for response. Whilst the fire service would have sought to implement measures, those measures still do not compensate for the non-existence of a fire hydrant. The fire service has as a responsible organization done taking some measures and so on and by investing in water tankers and so on. But this is not this is there is no substitute for a fire agent. Because of that a fire tender is built and designed to be hooked up to a fire agent for a supply of water. A fire tender is designed to move equipment from a point to the next point and engage in firefighting operations, being supplied by water, supplied with water from a water supply mechanism, whether it be a hydrant or something. So yes, we have, for a long time, been operating either with the absence of fire hydrants or the unreliability of the supply of water coming from fire hydrants. In some instances, the brass fittings of existing fire hydrants are vandalized and sold to scrap metal dealers, thereby contributing to the destruction of the environment and the safety infrastructure put in place for the prevention of fires and loss of life. I have written years ago on the need for us to have a new sprinkler system, a new set of hydrants. The mayor of George Stonebound so written on it. And at one time I thought that I, was, I had an original idea. I was at Linden not so long ago, and I was to my surprise, I saw that Linden had, since in the 1930s, 40s, at, at the, at the very system that I was advo I'm advocating. A proposal to have an upgraded fire hydrant system is currently being addressed by the administration. That is to have underground sewage, uh, underground pipes that would bring water directly from the Demerara River so that into high, into these hydrants. So at a moment's notice, you can have water at all times, 24-7, free. All you need is booster stations along the way. Because initially, anything that is now being done carries the cost. But when you look at the long-term effect, which is forever, when you look at this, what we save in terms of having no longer such magnitude of fires and a loss of life, then you cannot put a price on that. And uh, I, I think time has come for us to first of all determine who owns the hydrants. That is one of the sore points. And um, if we can start a new system, which I ho hope will be move towards that, then it, we will then determine the new owners of the, of the hydrants. I, to that end, I have the intention to shortly um, have a, a discussion with the mayor of Georgetown insurance companies because it, it affects them in terms of lot, the um, cost, fire cost, our ministry um, as, and other stakeholders because we want to be able to de discuss the idea of putting hydrants in a, in, in a grilled way, a, a grid way uh, all over Georgetown. So any part of Georgetown at any moment, at a moment's notice, if there's a fire, 
can access the water immediately. Whilst legislative enactments must be made for the new proposed system, the Ministry of Communities is already taking the new proposal into consideration whilst designing new housing schemes. Advancements in science and technology allow us to construct buildings in such a way that in the event of a fire, most of the damage and cost could be minimized. But sometimes the authorizing agencies for building construction and firefighters need more than that evidence of good science to ensure lives and properties are safe. There has been some uh, sections of a building code that is out, that was done by the Bureau of Standards. The fire service was a part of the agencies that assisted in, 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 in preparing this code. This is that this code has to be ratified and it has to be laid and made law. I know for a fact that city council has a building by law, but I don't think that I should I would call that a code. Because a code has to have a certain uh, more than uh, just a bylaw. As to type of construction, what you do with how you do the construction, the number of the type of materials used and this kind of thing. I would B would like to see a proper building code being enacted or be or being de de developed enacted, legislated, and be made law. So it's a uni it's uniformity in the building. It regulates the building industry. It regulates public safety in terms of buildings. These codes just made and maybe have them just as a goodwill. In modern societies, I don't, you know, I don't think that's, that, that could work. It has to be made law. It has to be enforced. The National Bureau of Standards in 2005, with collaboration from a number of agencies including the Fire Service, the Electrical Inspectorate Division, the Guyana Power and Light amongst others, established a building code regulation which advises on what should obtain when constructing a new building, whether for commercial or residential use. It is quite clear that while we have, uh, have been influenced and are being influenced by the Western cu culture of concrete buildings as well as the high rise aspect moving towards a several story type of houses. We have not really given attention to our water table and the type of soil as to whether we can sustain that type of buildings. What has also happened, and your question is so very re relevant in that it has highlighted to us the level of not only corruption, but incompetence of the past number of administrations which allowed those buildings to rise and to, to be erected at the unhappy expense of the even neighbors. For example, you have zoning, the zoning laws which were not really accepted or respected. This whole process is basically under the aegis of National Bureau of Standards. Secondly, the fact that other agencies have been involved in the creation and the development of, of the regulations and, and this code, meaning CHMPA, Fire Department, Bureau of Standards, and other ministries, means that it's not easy to pinpoint and to put down to one ministry as being responsible, although the, the Fire Department does have a large role to play. And the, the Tongan Contract Planning Act uh, also allows the zoning, which protects its, what's observed, protects residents by itself as against the industrial and commercial and so on. So these things are there. But in terms of fire, what we have in, with fire, first of all, Georgetown is still a wooden city. Le secondly, again, the style of building has also changed a lot. People going towards concrete, but the con concrete also burn. And the other thing is that we have got to understand that people are not absorbing the very laws that we need. If those laws of being six feet away from the, your neighbor is absorbed, then you have a fire space. And you can establish a, a fire wall much easier and would have less fires. But as I said earlier, the entire building code is honored in the breach. Hence, we are pay, paying the, the penalty of, um, for corruption. If, though, if in the old days, when people built houses of, of wood, and yet they were allowed to have that amount of space, you, you had a fence of four feet high, 
She had a back fence of six feet high. And those things act as preventative from fire spreading. Firemen were able to get between houses and buildings. And so they were able to not only save the next one, but they were able to save the same one. We did. Right now, we, as in Regent Street, a couple of years ago, Regent by Common Street, the, the firemen couldn't get to the back of the building. So all, not, not only lack of water, but there are a lot of these constraints that comes home to haunt us. That, that is the situation with the fire. This regulation, however, lacks the legal capacity that is needed to make the universal enforcement of its provisions a reality. Bear in mind that why you're not seeing these things is that the um, building code that you're asking about is not yet an act, has not yet become an act of parliament. It's still at the level of where you have reg regulations, where you have cooperation between agent inter agencies, and that itself, while it exists, it's is, it, and it's a, a hindrance at the moment in that enforcement of laws is not easy to now go about. We, we have uh, electrical inspectors who would go and make sure that you have electrical wiring that is up to date and who, can, who ought to be able to revisit after 20 years to have it rewired. You have um, building inspectors who will, will come and so on. But you, and I have public health ordinance would help to come and see and how to prevent diseases and so on. But until, while they've had talks, and that, these talks have been going on for over 20 years, long before my time, we, are, we have to get to the point where it, it is, these regulations are brought together and taken to Parliament. And it, when that time comes, then the agencies will be empowered to effectively police the necessary codes, thereby resulting in a reduction in fires thereby resulting in less harmful impact on the society and which will make, help the NBS to be able to function even better. Recently, the Ministry of Public Infrastructure held training sessions with electrical stakeholders to familiarize them with a new national electrical code. The legislative requirement for this code will soon be tabled in Parliament, giving it the necessary teeth needed for the enforcement measures to be taken. Other challenges faced by the fire service include malicious setting of fires known as arson and the existence of a number of derelict buildings. For 2015, the fire service has seen 62 cases of malicious setting of fires. In Guyana, the primary agency for educating on fire prevention and actual firefighting is the Guyana Fire Service. The agency has a rich and varied history commencing with its emergence as the Georgetown Fire Brigade as early as 1871. The Guyana Fire Service's roots are tied to the country's colonial history. Chief Fire Officer Marlon Gentle tells us more. Organized firefighting in Guyana started sometime in the late 18th century when Guyana was still a colony. This was as, as a result of the colony being developed into estates, villages, and different centers. And there was always this threat of fires, primarily because most of the infrastructure and construction was that of wood. At one stage, Georgetown, which was the main hub of the colony then, was stormed this tinderbox city because it was plagued by numerous fires. The colonial masters then decided to have some level of organized firefighting. And this primarily started with the, the uh, estates, the various areas having their own firefighting mechanism. And then it morphed into an organized firefighting unit under the then colonial police force. And it's from then that the Guyana Fire Service started to merge. The then British police force played an integral part in the fire service's establishment and growth because it was under their watch that the Georgetown Fire Brigade came into being. It became more organized under the British Guyana police force as the fire brigade section of the police force. And this existed until 1957. However, the Great Fires in the 1940s 
caused the British rulers to examine the system and its constraints, which resulted in the development of legislations to govern the body, and gave birth to the British Guyana Fire Brigade in 1957. The city of Georgetown experienced between 19, in the 1940s and, until 1945 some very devastating fires. You may have heard about the fires of the assembly rooms that wiped out the greater part of Robstown, which is the area around where the post office is, the Bank of Guyana, and those areas. And that fire caused the then uh, authorities to mount an inquiry into what was there in, in terms of organized firefighting, what were the limitations? It was then that a British expert came to Guyana and he conducted the inquiry and his recommendations were that firefighting is a separate and apart discipline and profession from that of policing. And therefore, Guyana or British Guyana, calling it British Guyana, needed a organized unit specifically geared perform duties of fire protection and firefighting in the colony. And that was when legislations were enacted in 1957 that caused the formation of the then British Guyana Fire Brigade. The British Guyana Fire Brigade was then formed in the city of Georgetown and New Amsterdam only. After Guyana gained its independence in 1966, the British Guyana Fire Brigade then became the Guyana Fire Service. One cannot dispute that there have been many advances in firefighting tactics over the years and that the fire service is a much more safer work environment than it was some years back. As a result of this, the responsibilities and scope of a firefighter's work have also changed dramatically, especially now with the advent of technology and modernization. The local response has long since shifted from a reactive one to a more proactive approach, one that is embedded in the fire prevention arm of the service. To this end, a modernization plan covering the years 2015 to 2020 was created by the Guyana Fire Service to guide the process of modernization. And that plan encompasses the whole modernization of the Guyana Fire Service in terms of how we do things, training, equipment, stations, the whole gambit. That we have now, we are now in the phase where we are setting up the support mechanisms to run the plan in terms of. Uh, the strategic management unit. Um, we have right now a consultancy going on with uh, uh, professional uh, fire protection officer out of Canada who's been here twice already for the year and who's working on our demand a new structure and to ensure that the structure is in sync with the new the new modernization trust that we have. In Guyana, the local fire service has advanced its operations from manually carried firefighting equipment to modern firefighting vehicles and apparatus, direct results of the technological age. However, the fire tenders in Guyana are custom made and hold 1,000 gallons of water, while others hold 400 gallons. The two 2,000 gallon water carriers pump 500 gallons per minute at high pressure. When the firemen are on the scene, they would pump the water directly from the source. One of the main highlights of the modernization plan is the adaptation to change in line with technological advancements, and the fire service is well in line with this aspect, as it is now more advanced with regard to equipment in firefighting. The modernization plan in terms of equipment speaks to generally ensuring that whatever you have or whatever you have is the right type and it's capable of delivering, and it is in a phased way. If one is to conduct an assessment of the operations of the fire service from its initiation, it would reveal that its standards of service have significantly evolved over time. The Guyana Fire Service has therefore taken some initiatives, such as increasing its present fleet, construction of fire stations in new areas, and in addition has a variety of vehicles to satisfy the needs of the countries at the international airports, as well as the regions in regions 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 10. The fire service currently operates out of 17 fire stations, five hinterland auxiliary locations, namely Port Kaitumo, Mabaruma, Madia, Kokwani, and Letem, with a total of 511 ranks 
both males and females. Meanwhile, it should be noted that although there has been significant changes in the operations, equipment and apparatus and the overall techniques and methodology in firefighting, the one thing that remains constant is the firefighters themselves. My role basically in the fire service is to do what a fireman does, and that is first to save lives. Secondly, to help or aid in the extinction of fires, and thirdly, to educate the public as it relates to fire and fire prevention. They still want to serve and help people. They still want to be the best at what they do, and they still have the unbridled enthusiasm and excitement for the job they love, firefighting. Being a firefighter is one of the most challenging jobs. It takes courage, a high level of fitness, a quick mind and the ability to follow training. Training enables a firefighter to save the lives and property. Did we say it takes courage? It takes more than courage as the Guyana Fire Service does not only consist solely of firefighters. In fact, it consists of a team of behind the scene workers. Every department plays a critical role in saving buildings and most importantly, lives. Carol Fretz of the control room deals with receiving of emergency phone calls. My role in here is, as, as Sister Bassi said, I'm a control room attendant. I'm a trained firefighter. But the main part I play as a control room attendant. But if by any chance they need assistance outside, I will attend, well, assist. And I'm a Yes. Train ambulance attendant too. Well, basically, what's happening here when the public anybody call nine one two, they call reporting a fire. My job, I will answer the phone, collect the information, say dispatch. We have this is the PA, the public address. We press the gongs, right? Send on the guns, the guy dispatch the vehicle to whatever location. After that, we'll filter the information to the officer as well. If it's a house on fire, all the relevant officers from the chief fire officer to the last cadet and inform them, well, what attendant 62 and crew are responding to a house on fire at whatever address. When they arrive, they will filter back the information to us. Well, if it's one building on fire, two building, any person trapped, we will report it if they need ambulance or any further assistance. I will filter that information to the officer, like the chief or the divisional officer who's, who's in charge of the operations center. Otis Charles, who has been working at the fire station for over 21 years, is responsible for the dispatching of vehicles in a timely manner. My role is uh, to overlook the operations as the operations officer. I report to my seniors with divisional officers per month, and the sub officer report to me. Our role is to ensure that once we receive a call at any one of the fire stations, that we dispatch our vehicle promptly to respond. Of course, we would respond once there's a house on fire, we respond with two stations, which is central, whichever close to the area. If it is west, East Bank, we would use west, East Coast, we would use Campbellville, if there's Georgetown, and if, it's, if it requires more than one week, we sell Albertong as a backup. All right, so basically we are overlooking the city, East Coast, East Bank, over there we have a fire station there also, but we would send a vehicle from Georgetown if there's a, 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 a okay, like a great uh, fire, probably like more than one building or so on, we would send Lenora. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself, how long you've been doing this, okay. and how you feel about this? I'm in the job 21 years now, and I feel very confident in doing firefighting. All right, most of my life I work other places, but most of my life I work with the NFI service, 21 years. So I'm very confident in firefighting, all right? I work in different departments. I work in the fire prevention department. I work at the airdrome. At present, I'm based at the airdrome also, so I'm, I'm covering two areas, airdrome as well as structural here in Georgetown. So I'm versed in different areas. Responding to the fire on the ground is the job of hundreds, including that of Marvin Harper, who has been in this profession for over 10 years. My role as a firefighter as a senior fireman, I normally are on the first striker, way by. I respond when the, when the gangs go off, I respond on the vehicle that's going out first. This way by we go, we roll the hose normally. And 
Not only will they know, but just in case or any person probably are chopping any building, we get a rescue team out from instruction from the officer. You're going to instruct us how to probably get the person out if it's possible. And basically, in general, that's my rule. Educating the public about fire prevention is the most critical aspect of saving lives buildings, assets, among others. Firefighting has become a less stressful and easy task over the years as there has been the development of a more cohesive approach amongst firemen and women in getting the job done. The Guyana Fire Service recognizes that its response to issues that exist and those that are emerging must be comprehensive, futuristic and innovative, and relevant to the present and the future. In this light, an even more aggressive approach to capacity building is being pursued in order to successfully deliver on its mandate. To its credit, the Guyana Fire Service has purposely built a facility to cater for the training needs of its members. That training school, located at Lenora, is now in its final stage of being outfitted. The idea is to have all of our ranks trained there, as well as inviting um, instructors from overseas to come into Guyana and run the training modules right here. Most of this training modules right here, with the exception of the highly technical stuff. Indeed, whilst Guyana, like its Caribbean counterparts, embraces training support from overseas, the focus is still on providing training that allows the firefighters to perform efficiently in the local context. That idea is primarily to give the persons conducting the training a insight into what obtains in the Guyana environment and train the officer, train their rank specifically to operate in the in the Guyana context. Wooden seat wooden buildings, a large amount of wood being used in construction, construction more of a tropical nature. And you know, it's far different to maybe what we'd obtain in some other countries. The Guyana Fire Service is also well on its way to transforming its operation, this by taking on an additional role. Adding to its mandate, the fire body will now be offering an ambulance service as well. In keeping with this new trust, the institution recruits are benefiting from training in first aid and emergency care resulting from close collaboration between the French Guyana Fire Service and the Guyana Fire Service and the Georgetown Public Hospital through the Vanderbilt University. When you look at the Guyana developing now, taller buildings, uh, you know, more road traffic usage and everything, definitely we have to look at new age methodologies of how we do rescue because the, the, the normal rescue that we had before from a two-story building now you know it's it's different and then there there are more roadways there are more road users we've been going to a lot of road traffic accidents recently and of course those rescues are they're very technical we also want to relaunch our ambulance service too we have started it in a very limited way but it's gonna be expanded to cater for all the areas that we operate and therefore the training in rescue uh, paramedic um, emergency medical care and so on will have to be at a higher level the objective of the guyana fire service is to have by 2018 75 percent of its workforce in every functional area meet their job specification are highly trained and are functioning at the performance standard in line with the mission and vision statement of the service. You're watching Guyana 411. We take this opportunity to say thank you to our brave firemen and women. You are our heroes. Until next week, stay safe and in this dry season, watch out for grass fires.